Welcome to another edition of the Market Tech Group Minute. Recently, a new trend has emerged in the healthcare delivery system. In addition to the increased volume of medical procedures being performed in the office setting, the variety of procedures is also increasing. For example, more non-invasive procedures are now performed in the office setting as both payers and technology vendors seem to encourage that shift. Several drivers such as lowered costs and increased accessibility are clearly positives for the patient, but concerns over safety and long-term patient outcomes are not clearly understood. Sharing with us the payer's perspective today is Donald Sacco. Mr. Sacco is the retired CEO of Regents Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Oregon. He was a co-founder and executive vice president of the Regents Group, an affiliation of four blue plans in the Northwest. He now provides consulting services to healthcare organizations and companies which provide products and services to the healthcare industry. Welcome to the TMTG Minute podcast, Mr. Sacco. Thank you, Vince. Okay. Well, let's get started, and let me ask you uh, what you think about the migration of medical procedures into the office. Is this a desirable trend? Well, Vince, office-based surgery can be a real benefit to patients uh, from a variety of standpoints. It can add to convenience uh, and comfort, and it also has the real opportunity to be uh, uh, more cost-effective. So, yes, it can be a benefit. And who would you say are, are there winners and losers in this shift? Well, in certain respects, there are. Um, there's been a migration over the years from inpatient to hospital outpatient and then uh, from hospital outpatient to freestanding ambulatory surgery center. And we actually began seeing about a decade ago um, a related increase in office-based surgeries. So um, in the end, uh, the hospitals are the ones who have lost uh, the high volume of surgical procedures to other settings that are unaffiliated um, with the hospitals themselves. I see. And, and what concerns would you have if more procedures are performed in the office as opposed to the hospital environment? Well, the concerns uh, are related to safety and quality uh, primarily. And then there's a secondary concern that I uh, mentioned, and that is utilization. Um, let me explain. From a safety and a quality perspective, uh, except for procedures that require you know, either uh, uh, local uh, anesthesia or mild sedation, uh, we, have to, we have to be assured that the uh, procedures can be done safely and by qualified staff uh, and that we have a system um, for reporting all of the experiences in the uh, office setting. And we don't have that today. So the uh, other thing that I mentioned was uh, a potential increase in utilization. And by that I mean we have seen in the past, at least from a payer perspective, when we have an abundance of facilities, we end up with a higher volume of services. And uh, that is of concern in terms of the uh, whole system's cost effectiveness, if you would. Right. And, and you're, we're going into the next question here, which is reimburse, reimbursements can influence a, a physician's practice. So if a procedure performed in the office is better reimbursed than the same procedure per, uh, performed in the hospital, clearly physicians will have a, a financial incentive to, to do more in the office. So when payers, um, such as a Blue Cross and Blue Shield, set office reimbursement rates, what, what's motivating their decision? Well, it's interesting. When uh, you look back uh, historically, the, there was an initial rea uh, reaction to uh, almost discourage the movement from uh, hospital, even hospital outpatient, to freestanding and to physician offices. Uh, and uh, that, that attitude, if you would, changed, and insurers began providing incentives for outpatient uh, freestanding facilities from an office perspective, they r rarely provided a facility fee, although uh, some insurers provided incentives by adding um, trade charges or other uh, reimbursement for incidental uh, costs. But more recently, the whole benefit structure is changing from an insurance perspective, and I think uh, 
m most people have heard of uh, consumer involvement and uh, efforts to get consumers more engaged in, in the healthcare process. And so the benefits have been changing. And in most cases today, uh, benefits for surgery um, include a coinsurance amount. And what that means is that patients are paying a percentage of the charges uh, or acceptable uh, costs, if you would, at the time um, of service. And so it becomes a benefit to them to look for the lowest cost setting. So in essence, um, re reimbursement is moving away from getting uh, variable payments to physicians based on location and getting the consumer more engaged by lowering out-of-pocket costs when they choose a, a lower cost setting. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you look at this historically, uh, were the payers, at, uh, in your opinion, taking an active role in changing uh, institutional or, or physician behavior in order to achieve a more efficient healthcare delivery system, or were they merely reacting to sort of this natural uh, shift? I think initially they were reacting, and as I indicated, uh, many were uh, reluctant to even acknowledge the, the shift in the trend. But at a point, there became the realization that the shift could provide meaningful savings as well as be, become an advantage for consumers. So they became engaged. So when we look at a sort of a public health policy uh, standpoint, uh, would, is the availability of more treatment options in the physician's office uh, lowering the cost of health care? Well, in theory, uh, a quality care, quality care rendered at the least cost setting obviously helps improve the whole system's effectiveness. And, you know, if we're separating the issue of quality from cost, Looking at the cost standpoint, it's something that I mentioned earlier, and that is to assure that the, the volume of services is commensurate with the, the need and that the, the capacity to perform services doesn't become the stimulus, if you would, to increase uh, the volume. Use an example that we saw historically. Um, there were studies that showed when physicians owned imaging services, if you would, they ordered more of those services than physicians who had no financial stake in um, the imaging equipment or facility. And that's the kind of thing that we would worry about from a cost standpoint. Mm -hmm. and, and overall, uh, as we talk about this kind of growth in, the, in, the, in this trend of office procedures, do you think this is uh, creating improved access for patients? Well, it, it certainly can add to uh, convenience and comfort, uh, and from uh, an access standpoint, uh, very definitely. I think that, uh, again, from a consumer standpoint, the questions that they have to begin asking is uh, related to uh, is, is the office uh, appropriate setting for the type of surgery uh, that they're uh, uh, prospectively going to undergo. Uh, is the staff trained? Is the equipment appropriate? Um, it's the issue of safety. And I think that's why what we will see as uh, more types of surgery migrate to the office setting, there's going to be even a stronger call for office-based standards uh, in order to be eligible for reimbursement. I see, and and you're starting to go on to to the consumer. So let's let's go there. W what are the pros and the cons? You mentioned a few, but let's try and clarify uh, the pros and the cons of this trend regarding the patient's interest and their experience. W what concerns are, are patients going to have about uh, about doing more procedures in the office setting? I think it boils down to the issue of safety first, and quality outcome second. Um, Obviously, the cost implications are something that we've already talked about, but from the consumer standpoint, I think that they need to be assured that when a surgery is proposed to be performed in an office setting, that, uh, that it's safe to do so and that the uh, uh, physician and the staff in that office are capable uh, and have the, appropriate, uh, have the appropriate experience to provide that service. In, in your opinion, um, uh, as we're shifting this, the point of care to the office, um, 
you, you mentioned that that it's got to be we got to be careful and make sure that we we uh, uh, maintain the same quality of care. So, uh, do you think this trend is going to uh, increase or decrease the quality of care, and and um, what things should should we be on the lookout for? And how can they improve the quality if if you don't think the quality is going to improve? Well, I, th I think that uh, everyone is aware that we have uh, a number of trends at work that include um, changing technology when it comes to being able to perform surgery uh, on a, with minimum uh, impact to the, to the body, if you would. I mean, minimally invasive surgery has begun to uh, take hold in all kinds of surgical areas. And I think that that's a, that trend itself is going to shift uh, more services from the inpatient to the outpatient setting, and likewise will allow for uh, more services to provi be provided on the uh, in the office. Um, and and as that happens, and as anesthesia continues to improve, and as the population ages, there are going to be a number of factors that encourage the, uh, the migration to the office setting. Okay. And let's look, talk sort of about the, the clinicians. What do you think their reaction is going to be to, to this migration of procedures? Well, I think cl clinicians are obviously highly capable people in their specialty, but they're also uh, very smart. M most of them are very smart businessmen, and they will respond based on what makes uh, good economic sense. Uh, for example, if uh, being able to do office surgery requires a, a relatively expensive investment in, in equipment and setup and so on, uh, they're going to want to make sure that uh, – there's some reasonable assurance that there's going to be a return based on the volumes that they anticipate they can do and the levels of reimbursement. Um, those, those issues will be either a barrier or uh, uh, an assistance to entry, um, where volumes can be forecasted to provide enough incremental re revenue and the safety and the quality requirements that will increasingly be applied to office-based surgery, uh, if they're not, if they don't become too onerous, I think uh, clinicians will continue to develop the capacity to perform office-based surgery. Okay, and and you're touching on it a little bit now, but uh, uh, what, what do you think of the, this this trend? Is it going to to continue, or have we kind of reached a, a plateau in this trend and, and maybe the, the migration of procedures have already taken place, maybe not as many new procedures will, will continue to shift. No, I think we'll continue to see a, a shift in, in uh, surgeries to the office for the reasons that I talked about before. I think the minimally invasive uh, aspect of surgery today provides many more opportunities for it to be done. Uh, um, on an outpatient basis in an office setting. Uh, anesthesia has changed dramatically uh, over the years, and this, again, allows for um, the uh, patient to be safely uh, released within a few hours of surgery. And the, the trend in our uh, baby boomer population uh, will stimulate uh, additional demand, putting pressure on existing capacity. And I think those will all be incentives for uh, uh, further development of office-based procedures. And are there particular clinical areas uh, which you think the migration is intensifying? And, and are those? Uh, and are there other clinical areas that maybe, you know, the trend may be reversing? They've, they've sort of tried tried it in the minimally evasive uh, area in, in the office, and it wasn't quite working. And, so the shift went backward for for that particular uh, clinical area. Well, Vince, admittedly, you're kind of testing my, the limits of my expertise in terms <laughs> of uh, <laughs> the clinical side. Sure. But uh, I I think that in the diagnostic categories, uh, be they imaging or um, even invasive procedures such as endoscopy and so on, these types of things will continue to offer opportunities to be performed in the um, in the office um, as arthroscopic surgery uh, becomes uh, uh, more and more pervasive for different parts of the body, uh, that, that allows for at least the consideration of migrating procedures to a lower level setting. So I think there are, there are a number of trends in place that uh, 
that will um, stimulate the continued migration. Um, I think that the first place, obviously, that benefits is always the outpatient, the freestanding outpatient facility area, but uh, it begins to impact physician office settings as well. Great. And, and obviously, it sounds like you, you believe that, that medical device companies should continue to invest in, in the research and development to, uh, to develop uh, and discover smaller and, and easier to use devices to continue this trend. Um, very definitely, and, and uh, I would say that it's more than just a cost issue and the opportunity to achieve cost savings, but if you take a look at what we've been able to accomplish over the years in surgical techniques, there's a, there's a tremendous p uh, uh, positive impact on the, on the quality of care, and uh, that will continue to be an overriding emphasis in terms of uh, what's needed in the healthcare system. So uh, medical device companies that offer an opportunity for both cost effectiveness and improved quality have a real uh, positive and bright future ahead, I, I believe. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Sacco. I certainly appreciate your perspective, and, and I believe our listeners definitely will appreciate your perspective as well. Thank you.